Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Dominant Species Marine. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing a couple of rounds today. Now, I do want to point out that the only reason this video is being made is because it was selected by one of the sponsors of this channel at the Patreon campaign. You can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash Games, and I do hope that you would consider directly supporting the channel if you enjoy videos just like this one. Now, I'd also like to ask that if you do enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as you subscribe button for the channel. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put relevant corrections in a pinned comment down below this video. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Each player is in control of a certain type of animal, and throughout the game we are going to be placing our cubes down onto the earth tiles, and each of these is a different species within that type of animal. Now what we're going to try to do is have the majority of our species on specific tiles when they score, and that scoring is just one of the many different actions the players can perform throughout the game. On a player's turn, they are going to send an action pawn over to an empty action spot over here and then immediately perform that action. And if they don't have any more pawns to place or if they have other reasons to do it, they could instead pull all of their pawns back and reset to then place these out later on. Now, when you place pawns onto these actions, they must go below the previously placed pawns that you have put down or to the right in that same specific line. So you have to be careful to not go below other actions that you want to do because you will have to pull back, spending an entire turn, to then free things up to go up to the top. Now, fortunately, players can dominate the various different elements in the game, and when you perform the domination action, you can actually gain these special action pawns. These are specific to these different types of elements, and they break several of the rules in the game, letting you bump out other players' basic pawns, as well as letting you go above other pawns that you have placed already out here. In addition to all that, it's just more pawns that you could have in front of you, which means you could hypothetically go longer before you have to pull all of your pawns back. So players are going to activate these actions, which will give them a wide variety of options. Uh, you could add more species cubes down, expand the world out with more of these tiles. You could also expand these thermal vents, which will definitely affect the landscape in a few ways that I won't go into right now. And you can also fight with each other, score various tiles to activate these very powerful cards, as well as actually adapt your own animal to better suit the environment that those species are in. Now, I'm going to go through all of these things in detail as we are actually playing the game, but I think for the moment, let's wrap up this overview and now start the game off. For today's tutorial, we are going to be controlling the fish animal over here, and we get to take the first turn of the game. We know that we go first because of this chart over here on the board. As you can see, it shows the crustaceans, fish, cephalopods, and reptiles, and the turn order is always from the bottom up, and we will go through this order for the entire game. Now you may notice up at the top it says food chain with arrows pointing down, and that means the reptiles are at the top of the food chain, then the cephalopods are, and then we are at the bottom of the food chain for this specific game. Of course, if this was a four-player game with crustaceans, then the crustaceans would be at the bottom of the food chain, and they would also take the first turn. Now this food chain order has to do with ties when we score various tiles on the board, and I'll explain how that works later on in the tutorial. So let's focus on our board, and as you can see, it says on our turn, we can choose one of these two options for our entire turn. This option one says we can retrieve all of our pawns, and option two says we can place a pawn onto an empty action space. Now this is what we're going to do, considering we haven't placed any pawns yet, so there's no reason to retrieve them. And as you can see, in a three-player game, all players begin with five of these basic action pawns in their animal color. Our color is blue, so let's now place this out and perform the associated action. So let's focus on the action display, and as you can see, there are 12 different actions that show up here. Now, at this point, regression, depletion, and autotrophs are not actually viable actions. Those will become options later on in the game, and I'll describe how that happens and what they do later on in the tutorial. That means there are effectively nine different action options for us, and when we place this pawn down, we have to put it onto an empty fossil symbol like this. Now we are not allowed to place this onto a special pawn spot, and those show up on some of the actions, and they show this white cylinder next to them. So that means even though this is empty, we cannot place this down here, because only the white special pawns can go onto those spots, and I'll talk about that in more detail later. 
We still have a bunch of options out here to go for, and I think for our very first turn, we are going to do a speciation action. Now with that in mind, let's focus in on it. As you can see, there are currently four empty fossil spots that we could go onto, and a fifth special action spot, which we cannot go on with our basic pawn. Now each of these actions has a randomly placed element tile next to them, and for this very first turn of the game, I think let's place our basic pawn onto that fossil there. As you can see, that position is associated with this plankton element token. What this means is we can select one plankton element out on Earth, and then we can speciate into the Earth tiles that are touching that plankton element. So let's focus over here on the map, and as you can see at the start of the game, there is one element tile of each of the six elements, and those are all around this coral reef, where each player has three species cubes. Now that means we have to choose this plankton element because it's the only one currently on the board. And as you can see, each element is placed on the intersection point of up to three hexagon tiles. So this plankton element is touching this open ocean tile, this seamount tile, and the coral reef. And that means after selecting this, we can speciate in up to all three of these, and we only have to speciate into the ones that we actually want to. With this in mind, let's focus back on the speciation area, where it tells us how many of our species cubes we can place down onto tiles, depending on what type of tile those are. Now we know that that plankton is next to a coral reef, which says we can add up to two of our species cubes into that. We are also next to a seamount, which we can add three, and open ocean, where we can add up to four. So let's now start adding these species, and the way we do that is we take these cubes from our gene pool and place them onto the board. As you can see, we currently have 31 of our species cubes on our mat, and it's important to note that in general, when these cubes are removed from the board, they don't come back to our mat. So it's possible we could place too many of these out and run out later on in the game, which could make it hard to vie for various things, but at this point in the game, I think let's place as many of these cubes down as we can. Now, as I said, we are going to put up to four into an open ocean, up to three into a seamount, and then up to two in the coral reef, and I think let's go for all of that. That means we're actually placing nine of our 31 cubes right now with our very first action of the game. So we can add two into the reef, we can add three onto that seamount, and four into the open ocean, and that has finished our speciation action. All right, it's now time for the cephalopod player to go. They've decided to place an action pawn, and they're going to put this over here on the adaptation spot. As you can see, there are two regular pawn locations here, and then one spot for a special pawn. And when you do an adaptation action, you simply take any of the element tiles currently in this area, and you place it onto an empty spot on your animal board. In this case, the cephalopods want to adapt into being able to eat worms. So they can take this element and place it onto an empty one on their board. As you can see, each of these player boards starts with three pre-printed elements on it, and there are three other spots. If all three of these were full, then the basic adaptation action would not be able to add any more, because you can only add them down onto empty spots. Fortunately, you can swap these out when you do a special pawn adaptation action, and I'll talk about that in more detail later on. Orange is done, so now the purple reptiles can go. And after considering their options, they are going to speciate over onto this empty fossil spot. That is next to the sponge element, so they can select any one sponge element on the board and then speciate onto its adjacent tiles. In this case, currently the only sponge is there, so that means they can speciate to the seamount, this seagrass meadow, as well as the coral reef in the center. When they look back over here, that means they can put up to two in the reef, up to two into the seagrass meadow, and up to three onto that seamount. They've decided to place the full amount of species down, so three will go onto the seamount, and now they have the same number of species as we do. Two will go onto this seagrass meadow, and two will go down into the coral reef. Now that the reptiles have gone, we can take our next turn. I think we should place another action pawn, and when we put this out, we have a new restriction. Whenever there are other action pawns of our color out here, we must put new ones below the previously placed ones, or we could go to the right of the bottommost one as long as it's on the same line. That means we could speciate again if we want to, because the worms and gastropod options are to the right of our lowest placed token, which is right over there. Uh, now, I don't think we do want to speciate again. Instead, let's go down to migration. As you can see, there are three basic pawn options and one special pawn option. So we can place this onto any of the three basic pawn options, and I think let's go over to this one. 
Now, after that, we can then move a number of cubes equal to the number of cubes that shows up next to the spot that we chose. So by going here, that means we can move up to five of our cubes out there on the map. The way this works is we can select up to five of our cubes and then move each of them onto an adjacent tile. This is functionally simultaneous, which means you can't actually move the same cube multiple times. Now I did say adjacent tile, and those are tiles that share a flat surface with the tile that we are moving from. Now before we start moving, I'd like to talk about the difference between a thriving and endangered species. So let's look down at our player mat, and in particular at the adaptations in the top right corner of it. Now the fish start off with two of the plankton element adaptations and one of the algae, and what that means is every single one of our species cubes on the map is going to be either thriving or endangered based off of if there is an element next to that specific tile that matches up with one of our adaptations. So if we put a cube down onto a tile that does not have any plankton or algae at the moment, then that cube is endangered, whereas even if there is just one algae next to that tile, this cube is thriving. With this in mind, let's focus back out on the map and move up to five of our species. Now, for example, if we moved this species here onto this sand plane, you'll notice that the only elements around this are gastropods and worms. Now, there are none of the plankton or the algae elements, so that species is currently endangered. Now, the fact that this species is endangered will only come into play when extinction events happen or other special cards, and those only happen when people do an evolution action, which we haven't seen just yet. Now, it's possible that might be coming up soon, so I don't think it makes sense to push a cube into an endangered spot. So instead, I think let's head in this direction. As you can see, there is a algae element right there touching this land and this kelp forest, which means our species cubes would be thriving on each of these tiles. So I think let's start by moving two of these over to the land and then one of them over to the kelp forest. We do still have two more movement available to us, but again, remember we cannot move any of these cubes a second time. You know what? I think let's move another cube out of this coral reef and send it into this kelp forest, so we have two and two, and then with our last move, let's go from this open ocean over here back into the coral reef. So our migration of up to five cubes is done, and as you can see, all of our cubes are currently thriving because all of them are on tiles that have at least an algae or a plankton element touching them. All right, our turn is done, which means the orange player can now go. If they wanted to, they could adapt again because that is to the right of their bottommost basic pawn, but instead they've decided to speciate, and they will go over here where they can now speciate adjacent to a worm's element. The only one on the map currently is here, and that means they could speciate into the open ocean, the coral reef, as well as the sand plains. When they focus back over here, they see that they can add up to four into the ocean, up to three onto the sand, and up to two onto the reef. After considering it, they are going to do a full speciation, so they can put the four onto the ocean, the three onto the sand plains, and two into the coral reef, and that has finished out their action. So the purple reptiles can now go. They've decided to take a wanderlust action. There are two basic pawn spots for that, and one special pawn spot that I'll discuss later. Now they're going to go over here, and the next thing that they do is choose one tile that's currently face up on one of these wanderlust stacks. Now they've decided to go for this one right here. That is a seamount tile, and now they can add this onto the board onto an empty area that is adjacent to at least one other tile on the board. In this case, they've decided to place the tile here, and now it's time for them to score bonus points. As you can see, there is a table in the bottom left corner of the board, and that shows quantity and victory points that you gain. Now, in order to get the quantity for this scoring, they now need to count up the number of adjacent tiles to the one they placed that matches the terrain type of that tile, and you also include the tile itself. So the tile is one quantity, plus there is a single adjacent seamount, so that is a second one. If this was a seamount as well, then that would be one, two, three, but of course, in this example, that is the open ocean, so their quantity is two. Then they can look to the bonus point table, the 2 is next to a 3 victory point spot, so that means the purple player can immediately gain 3 victory points for placing this tile. So they'll go from 0 up to 3 victory points. The next thing that happens for a Wanderlust action is the active player has the option of choosing up to one element next to this action that they can then place onto any of the corners of the tile they just placed. Now they have decided to place this sun element token down, and they're going to put it right over here. Once again, it had to go onto one of the corners of the tile they just placed. 
Now, what that means is all three of these tiles just gained the sun element, which is going to change the possibilities of being thriving or endangered for a lot of the species. And it also comes into play with domination, which I have not described just yet, but I will get to soon. After this, the final thing that happens for the Wanderlust action is in food chain order and going down, each player can move as many of their species cubes as they want to from adjacent tiles onto the newly placed tile. Once again, this is the newly placed tile, and the reptile player has up to three species cubes that can be moved onto it. Now, they've decided to move just two of these over, and then after that, in food chain order, the cephalopod player could move their species in. They do have four over here, so they can move up to four of them over, but you'll notice that this tile currently just has a sun element on it, which means that if an animal does not have that adaptation, then any of those cubes on this tile would be threatened. Now, the reptiles start with two of the sun element, so they are thriving, but none of the other animals in the game with the cephalopods or us as the fish are adapted to the sun, so that means if any of us put cubes in there, then they would be endangered, which could be a bad thing for us later on. With that in mind, the orange player has decided they are not going to move any of their cubes, and then when it comes to us, I just don't think it makes sense. It's very possible that our endangered cube could be wiped out before it actually does anything for us, so I think let's just hold tight. Once again, I will describe the perils of being endangered with the extinction events later on in the tutorial. That Wanderlust action is coming to an end, and before the game moves on, it's now time to talk about the special cards that each player has in front of them, and in particular ours, which is called Camouflage. Now, at the start of the game, each player was given three random trait cards, and we all got to choose one simultaneously, and this is the one that we decided to go with. Now, that says that for the rest of the game, at the end of each Wanderlust or Tectonics action by an opponent, we may put up to one new species from our gene pool onto the newly placed tile. So, that means in this moment, we could take up to one of our species cubes from our gene pool and add it directly onto that tile, but remember, it would be endangered, because currently, the sun element is the only one next to that tile, and we do not have any sun on our board. In addition to that, there are unfortunately no elements on the Wanderlust action for the two things that we are adapted for. If there were, then we could potentially place this down as endangered and then do our own Wanderlust action to try and place one of these tiles adjacent to it, but that is not going to be the case. Now, the main way that we add more elements to our board is adaptation, and there are two of those sun elements up there, but of course, that is above our lowest played token, which is actually below the screen over here, so right now we do not have the ability to place onto that spot. So if we place this cube, it would most likely be endangered for a while. These species cubes are a limited supply in our gene pool, so I think let's not add this out, because it's somewhat likely we would actually lose it before it gave us any benefits. So that means we are not going to activate our camouflage card, and before we move on with the game, let's take a look at the trade cards that our opponents have. Our cephalopod opponent chose Seasonal Migrants. That says for the rest of the game, whenever they do a migration action, they can move one more of their species cube than is listed on the action spot where they put their pawn. In addition to that, each of their species cubes may migrate up to two spaces away. Remember, normally you can only go onto a single adjacent one, so that means that the orange player is a lot more flexible with that migration action. Finally, we have the reptile player's trait, and that says Solitary. Now, this does not give them any special abilities while playing the game, but it does give them extra ways to score points. This says they will gain one victory point whenever a tile is scored where their animal has exactly one species present. Remember, their species are these cubes, so that means that they will gain bonus points for scored tiles where there is just a single reptile cube on it. This does not apply to the other species cubes that might be there from their opponents. Up to this point, I've not discussed how we score tiles just yet, and I will get to that soon. Alright, the Reptile player is done with their turn, which means we are next to go, and let's place another pawn out. When we focus back on the action display, you'll see that our lowest pawn is here on the rightmost spot for the basic pawns in the migration area, so that means the only legal spots for us are below this, which is going to be competition, evolution, or domination. Now, I don't think it makes sense to do competition right now, although I suppose it is worth mentioning what this actually does. When you do one of these actions, you will then target a single tile on the board that matches the terrain of the token that's underneath it, and these are randomly placed out here at the start of each round. 
Then, as long as the active player has at least one of their cubes on the selected tile, they can remove up to the number in red of species cubes from their opponent, and those cubes are removed from the game. That means if we went over here, we could select an open ocean tile where we have at least one of our species on it and remove up to three other species. Uh, but at this point, I don't think that really makes sense for us to do. This is more about jockeying for the various scorings, and at the moment, there are quite a few good options out there. So instead of doing competition, let's look down over here and perform an evolution action. Much like competition, you'll notice that underneath each of the five options here, there are random terrain tiles, and these were pulled out of this bag at the start of the round, and at the start of future rounds, we will dump these in and pull new ones out. Now, when we do an evolution action, we are going to select one of the open spots, and then we are going to select a single tile out on the board that matches this terrain type, and then we are going to score that tile. What that means is the player with the most species on that tile will get the most points, depending on the tile, and then the second player will get the second most points, and so on, until all of the points are scored for that tile. Now our options are land, reef, sand, or vent, and I think let's go over here and score one land tile. At this point in the game, the only land tiles out here are near the top of the board, and we do actually have our cubes on one of them. So let's choose this tile here and score it. When we focus in, you'll notice at the top of this tile, as well as all of the other tiles, there are numbers that descend from left to right. The leftmost number is the amount of victory points that the player who has the most species on that tile will get. The next number after that goes to the second place player, and so on until all of them are scored. That means up to four players could score points when a land tile is scored, but over here with this seagrass meadow, only the first and second place players would be scored. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, what happens if there is a tie? For example, if we were scoring this land, and the reptile player also had two cubes on there. Now, in this case, we would look over to the food chain to break that tie, and the animal higher in the food chain amongst those tied will break the tie in their favor. That means the reptiles will always break ties in this game, and the cephalopods will break ties against us, but will lose ties to the reptiles, and as the fish, that means we are going to lose all ties when scoring tiles for the entire game. That being said, remember we actually do turn order in reverse food chain order, so there are also benefits for being lower down on that. Now obviously at the moment we do not have a tie over here because the reptile player did not move in. So when we score this land tile, we are in first place, which will get us eight victory points. And since no one else is here, no other points will be gained by our opponents. So that is a great scoring situation for us. In fact, the land tiles have the highest scoring potential out of any of the tiles. The kelp forests are a close second with their seven, four, and two victory points scored when they happen. So let's gain eight victory points, which brings us up to eight. After scoring victory points for the tile, we now need to see if there are any thriving species cubes of the active player on that scored tile. In this case, we do have cubes over here and we are thriving because there is at least one element around this tile that matches an element on our player board. In this case, that is algae. Since there is at least one thriving cube of the active player on the scored tile, the active player must now play an evolution card. With this in mind, let's focus back on the action area, where you can see there are numbers going from 1 all the way up to 5, with card icons underneath them, and each of those are associated with the 5 different evolution action spots. We decided to go over here, which is next to the 1, so what that means is we can perform the evolution card in slot 1. If our token was over here, then instead we could perform the card in evolution slots 1, 2, or 3, so the farther over to the right you go, the more evolution card options you'll have, if you go over here, you could perform up to one evolution card, but it can be from any of the slots. Obviously, by going into the leftmost spot, we don't have a choice. We must execute the evolution card in the first spot. So let's focus over here, where we can see the five cards and the numbers next to them. Now, as I said, we can only execute the card in the one spot, so we must perform this. But again, if we were on the three spot on the action, we could choose this card, that card, or that one, because that is the three over there. Now, either way, we must perform the symbiotic card, so let's focus on this one here. At the bottom of the card, it says your animal and animals that have fewer elements than yours each gain one random element from the draw bag. Now, when it says you, that's referring to the active player, which is us. So we can count our elements, and we have three, and then every one of our opponents with fewer elements than we do can do this action along with us. 
Fortunately for us, our opponents either tie or have more elements than us, so we are the only ones who get to draw a random element out of the bag and place it onto our board. The element bag is over here, so let's see what we get, and it is going to be a sun. All right. So we can place this down onto an empty spot on our player mat, and now we can actually thrive in areas with sun. With that in mind, I'm now kicking myself for not using this camouflage ability to put a cube down over there because we would now thrive over here with that sun element. But of course, we had no way of knowing that we'd pull the sun element out of the bag. But this does mean in the future when we move around more, it could be a good thing to move into the spot over here because we would thrive on that tile. All right, we are now done with this card. And it is worth noting that this symbol in the bottom right or that symbol in the bottom left of some of these cards has no impact when you actually perform the cards. That comes into play when new ones are added to the row, and we might see that right now. We are finished with this card, so we can place that into a discard pile, and now the rest of these cards are going to slide down. We can now fill the top spot in with a card from the top of the deck, and if there are any symbols down at the bottom, we need to immediately perform their events. This uh, skeleton fish symbol is for an extinction event, and the full fish over there is a survival event. Some cards might even have both of these on them, and the moment the card is revealed, we perform the associated event if that icon shows up. So this biomass card has some text that is performed when the card is scored, but in this moment, we now need to do an extinction event because that icon showed up on the card when it was flipped. The way extinction events work is quite simple. Every player is just going to take every one of their endangered cubes from the board and remove them from play. Remember, we almost put a cube down over here onto the C-mount, but I didn't because it would have been endangered because at the time we were not adapted for the sun. Well, if we had not randomly pulled this and we had risked it by putting that there, then this would have been removed because it would have been endangered. Obviously, in retrospect, it would not have been in this moment, but we could not have counted on that happening. Now, at the moment, no players have decided to risk endangerment, so none of these cubes are endangered, and none of them will be removed in this extinction event. Now, I did mention that we will have a survival event once these icons show up, and I'll describe the details of how that works later on in the tutorial. Our turn is done, and now the orange player has decided to go, and they are going to Wanderlust. So they can choose the top tile from one of these stacks, although before they do that, uh, this tile right here should have been flipped face up during the last Wanderlust action, so this should have already been over there. Now the orange player can choose from one of these three options. In this case, they are going to place a kelp forest out, and they're going to place it right over there. Next up, they can score bonus points for the adjacent kelp forest tiles. There is one adjacent one, so that's one plus one for the tile they placed, which means they will score bonus points at a quantity of two. Once again, that is going to be three victory points, which means orange can gain three points, bringing them up to three. After that, they can add an element onto that tile, and they are going to put this gastropod element down, and they have decided to put it right over there. The cephalopods have two of that element on their board, so that means they went from being endangered in all three of these tiles to now thriving in all three of these tiles. So I think it's probable that they will be migrating over here sooner rather than later. It does seem like they are trying to set themselves up for a good migration. After that, in food chain order, we can move our species into this new tile here. But we, as the fish player, are the only one with species who could move. Unfortunately for us, we are not adapted to the gastropods, which means any cubes on the spot would be endangered, and we are in the same situation we were before. Um, I don't think let's risk it, let's leave these cubes over here, and once again, let's not use our camouflage ability, because that would just take one of our cubes from our gene pool and put it down into that kelp forest, where it would be endangered and potentially at risk to be removed in the next extinction event. So that Wanderlust action is done, and I'll remember to flip this over this time. So there are two sand plan options face up here, and one coral reef. Orange is done, so now the purple player can go. And they've decided to migrate. That is going to let them move up to three of their cubes. They'll move from this sea mount over to an open ocean, and from this seagrass meadow to land. And they could move again, but they've decided they're not actually going to use their last move. Currently, they have five to the five of the orange player here on the coral reef. And remember, the purple reptiles always break ties. So if they moved one out from over there, then they would actually be in second place compared to first right now, which is a three-point difference. But again, that only happens if the coral reef is scored. Um, either way, the purple player decided to go onto the three-movement spot and only use two just to deny extra movement from their opponents. 
Well, we are next, and if we wanted to, we could perform another evolution action. Currently, the options are scoring a reef tile, a sand tile, or a vent tile, which means we could score this coral reef in the middle where we are in third place, this sand tile over here where we are not even present, so we would not be able to perform an evolution card. The last option was vents, and at the moment there are two vent tiles on the board. As you can see, this is a slightly smaller tile placed on top of other ones, and as soon as this tile is placed on top of another one, that whole area is a vent. The previous tile does not matter anymore. Now, at the moment, the two vent tiles in the game don't have any species cubes on them at all, so I don't think that makes sense either. So I guess I've convinced myself that doing another evolution action right now is probably not going to be the best idea. Now, if we wanted, we could do a recall action to pull our pawns back, but before we get to that, I think for this turn, let's do a domination action. As you can see, there are these player symbols next to a couple of the spots, and these are only available at those player counts. What that means is in a two-player game, both of these aren't here, and there's only one domination spot. In a three-player game, this three-player spot opens up, but the four-player spot is still blocked. And in a four-player game, there are three. So effectively, there's always one less domination spot than the number of players. Now, the difference between these two spots doesn't really matter, so I figure we'll go over here and now perform the first domination action of the game. Now, before we actually perform the domination action, I need to describe how players dominate certain elements in the game. Now, each player can dominate up to all six of the elements at any point in time, but that doesn't actually mean anything until you perform the domination action. So when it comes to dominating these elements, we first have to count up the number of tiles on the board that have at least one of that element touching it and that have at least one of our species. For example, in order to figure out if we dominate the sun element, we would count up the number of sun element adjacent tiles that have at least one of our species, and that would be one, two, three, four. Obviously, there are other tiles adjacent to the sun elements where we are not at, but those don't count for this. So there are four of our occupied tiles next to sun elements, and then we multiply that number of tiles by the number of that element that we have on our board. For example, we have one sun element, so that means our domination value is four times one or four. Next up, we can check to see if we dominate that element by seeing where that element currently is over here on the track. Now, this is a victory point track for all of our tokens, but it is also a domination point track. As you can see, there is a token for each of the six elements in the game, and they all start out at one. Now, what this means is since we have a domination value of four and the current domination value of the sun is one, we do indeed dominate the sun because we have a value of greater than where this token currently is. So when we do a domination action by putting our pawn over here, we then will perform actions on an element that we currently dominate. Now, that means right now we could choose the sun if we wanted to. But we can look over here and see that the reptile player has two of those sun tokens on their board. And they are currently in one, two, three, four, five, six of these tiles on the board that are adjacent to a sun element. That means the reptile player's domination value is six times two or 12 compared to our domination value of four. Now, in this moment, the reptiles dominate the sun and we also dominate the sun, but the reptiles could potentially do a domination action after us for the sun, which would pull some of our benefits away, and I don't like the idea of that. I'll talk about those benefits very soon, though, because we are going to perform a domination action on something. It's just not going to be the sun element. Instead, I think let's go for plankton. Right now, there is a single plankton element on the board, and it is touching three tiles, and we have at least one of our species in each of those, so that means our tile value is three. On our board, we have two of the plankton symbols, which means our domination value for plankton is three times two, or six, and that is greater than the one that that token starts at. So, we currently dominate plankton, and now when we perform this domination action, we are going to reap the benefits of that domination. Uh, in particular, this one is good, considering neither of our opponents are adapted to plankton at all, so we are in the clear lead when it comes to this element. The first thing we do when we perform the domination action on an element that we currently dominate is we can take the special action pawn for that element, as well as the control token for it. At the start of the game, these all are on the board, but later on in the game, if you dominate an element that has been dominated by somebody else before, then you actually take this pawn and control token from them. That means if we had decided to do a domination on the sun, we would have taken these pawns, but then if the reptile player also dominated the sun, they would take both of these away from us, and this is the main benefit of even doing the domination action. Obviously, we chose not to do that, so for now, this is on the board. And now we can place this control token and this special action pawn in front of us. 
The next thing that we do is we find the element token on this track associated with the one that we dominated, and we are going to move this up to the spot that matches our current domination value. So we take the plankton token and we move it up to the six spot. So that means in the future, if anyone wants to dominate plankton, they must have a domination value of greater than six. That means actually at the moment, we technically no longer dominate plankton because our domination value is six and this token is currently at six. But fortunately, we get to keep this until any other player potentially takes this away from us later on in the game. Now these special action pawns are great because not only are they another action that we can use, but when you place them, they have some special rules of their own. These are explained on the right side of our board. It says that white special pawns may go above your pawns and they may go onto a space occupied by an opposing basic pawn. What that means is on our next turn, we could place this special action pawn anywhere onto these free spots, or we could put it onto any of these spots that has an opposing basic pawn. If we did that, we simply kick that out and give it back to them, so it's not the end of the world for them, and then we get to do that action. Now, in addition to being able to place above your other pawns or on top of opposing pawns, we can also place our special action pawns onto the special action places on the board. There are six of these on the board, and all of them have a slight variation on the main action that they are associated with. The game does come with a nice cheat sheet explaining all of these, and let's talk about them now. Up here, this one is a regular adaptation action. However, when you place that token on your board, you can instead swap that token out for one that was already on your board. Remember, when you do an adaptation action, normally you just fill in a blank spot, but the special action lets you swap those tokens out, making you even more flexible later on in the game. Next up, the speciation special action lets you perform this action with any of the elements currently on the board. You are not restricted to an element token like you are with these basic action spots. After that, the special pawn wanderlust action works the exact same way as the regular wanderlust, but when you finish that turn, you immediately take another turn. Moving on, there is a special action spot for the tectonics action, and I haven't actually described this one just yet. The short version of it is we can place more of the vents down onto the board, and normally they have to go onto the edge of the grid, whereas this special action spot lets you place it onto any tile on the board. Now, I'll describe the details of how tectonics works later on in the tutorial, and we can now move on to talking about the special action spot for migration. This one is quite simple. It lets you move every single one of your species cubes if you want to. Now, the final one is competition, and that lets you remove up to one opposing cube on up to two of any tiles on the board, but you do have to have at least one of your species on each of those tiles. You can target the same tile twice in order to remove two cubes from that single tile if you want to, or you could spread it out amongst two tiles. So we're going to have lots of good options available to us on our next turn if we want to use this special action pawn, and we'll just have to see what we end up going with when that turn happens. The final thing I'd like to talk about with regards to the domination has to do with this control token here. Now, this is going to make it obvious who actually controls this specific pawn. So if this is out there on the board and we do a recall action, we know that we get to recall this token here. The other reason this is important is because when the game is over, each of the control tokens in front of us will be worth victory points equal to the current domination value of that token out here on the track. That means if nothing else changed and the game ended right now, this would be worth six victory points because that associated plankton token is at the six spot on the track. So there are reasons to actually dominate an element that you already dominated earlier and already have the pawn for because you could get significantly more points for it during end game scoring because you might have put yourself in a situation where your domination value is much greater than it was earlier in the game when you did this to take the action pawn. Well, at this point, our turn is done, and it's now time for the orange player to go. Now, they did set themselves up for a good migration action, but they've decided to skip over that and go all the way down here and do their own domination action. Remember, there are only two of these spots available in a three-player game, so by doing that, that means the purple player cannot do a domination action of their own until one of these tokens are removed. Orange has decided to select the gastropods for this domination, and right now, even though there are two of those tokens out here on the board, they currently only occupy two hexes that are adjacent to one of those tokens. If they had migrated first onto a lot of these, they would have a much higher domination value, but they were worried that the reptile player would do a domination action on their next turn and block them out, so they decided to get in on this early to gain access to that special action pawn. So, their tile count is two. 
and they have two gastropod elements on their board, so their overall domination value is 2 times 2, or 4. That is greater than 1, which is where the gastropod token started, so this is now going to go up to the 4 spot, and then the orange player can take the gastropod special action pawn and control token. Orange is done, so now the purple player can go, and they've decided to perform an evolution action. In this case, they are going to go here, which is next to a reef spot, so that means they can target one reef and score it. Currently, there is just one coral reef on the board, and the reptile player is in first place because they break the tie with the cephalopods since the reptiles are at the top of the food chain. So the reptiles will gain six points, the cephalopods will gain three, and we will gain two points since we are the third place player. This is going to bring the reptiles up to nine, the cephalopods will go up to six, and we will go up to ten. After that, the reptiles must perform the first or second evolution card since they have at least one thriving cube on the scored tile. Their options are omnivore and monotypic habitat. The omnivore says they could select a tile that their animal occupies and they could remove one element from that tile and eliminate one species cube from that tile, whereas the monotypic habitat says they would score bonus victory points based on the number of tiles on which their animal is the only animal present. When they look out to the board, they are on two tiles where they are the only ones there, and they've decided those three victory points from the bonus table are going to be better than just removing a element token from the board, so they are going to go with the monotypic habitat. Once again, they are going to get the bonus points for the number of tiles where they are the only ones there. That's two, which is going to give them three more points, and then this card will be discarded. So they will go from nine up to twelve. Next up, all of these cards can slide down, and now we need to see a new card from the top. Let's take a closer look at this card. It's called Solar Radiation, and it says that when this card is performed with an evolution action, then the active player can, on each tile that they occupy, can return X species there to their owner's gene pools, where X equals the slot that this card occupies. Now, the slot number is in the top right, so currently this is in slot 5. That means if somebody managed to perform this while it is in the 5th slot, then the active player could return up to 5 of the species cubes from every tile that they occupy back to their owner's gene pools. So this is a very powerful card that gets less powerful as it slides down, but of course even at the one slot, this is still a significantly impactful effect. Now in addition to this, i now like to point out the bottom part of this card, because as you can see it says while this card is in play, all evolution scoring is halved, rounded up. Now some of these cards show this blue bottom, and that means this effect will be active for as long as this card is currently face up on this row. So, as soon as somebody chooses the solar radiation effect, this will no longer be there, but until that happens, the evolution scoring just got halved, which is definitely not good for players who have invested heavily in the higher victory point scoring tiles like we have. Once again, we've gone to the land and the kelp forest with the 8 and 7 victory point first place scorings, so that solar radiation is going to knock that down to 4 and 4 respectively, because again, you do round up when you cut that in half from the solar radiation card. Well, the purple player's turn is done, which means we can now go. And the only thing that we could do is place our special pawn out or retrieve our pawns. We have no legal places to put our basic pawn because our lowermost one is on the domination spot and there are no empty spots to the right of it. Well, let's go ahead and use our special pawn. And remember, we could place this down onto any spot that's currently occupied by an opposing basic pawn, and we'd kick that out and give it back to them, and we can also place this above any of our other placed pawns. With that in mind, let's go all the way to the very top of the action display and perform the first abundance action of the game. Now, the way this works is rather simple. We just take one of these element tokens from the display, and in this case, we'll take the plankton, and then we put this down onto an empty corner of any hex currently on the board. Now, I think we should place this plankton right over there, and that way, we are now not going to be endangered in any of these three spots. Obviously, we aren't there yet, but I do think expanding in that direction is probably going to be a good thing for us, and by putting that token down, we are paving the way to make that happen. Our turn is done, so now the orange player can go, and they are going to use their special pawn, which they will use to migrate. Now, they could go here and migrate twice, but instead, since this is a special pawn, they could kick out one of the basic pawns. In this case, that's going to be ours. Again, it must be one of their opponents. This will go back into our area, and now the orange player can perform this action here. Now, instead of doing that, they could, of course, 
just go there, and that is probably what they're actually going to do. Uh, now this lets them move up to all of their species cubes on the board. In addition to that, the orange cephalopods are seasonal migrants. That means their migration value would be normally one greater than it is specified on the board, but of course they can move all of their cubes, so that won't help them. But then here, it says their species can migrate up to two spaces each instead of the normal one. Currently, they do have 12 cubes on the board, and they can move up to every single one of them. Now, they want to spread out a decent amount, and they're going to start over here. They're going to send one of their cubes two spaces, and they get to go twice again because of their seasonal migrant ability. And then this one, they're just going to send once. They're going to send another one of these once over, so that means that they currently are breaking the tie to be in first place in the land. Of course, the victory points for that are halved because of that solar radiation card currently on the display. After that, they are going to send both of these two spaces into that kelp forest, and then they're going to send two of these into this kelp forest. Next up, they want to spread these cubes out onto a few tiles. They're going to send this one there, this one will go there, and this one will jump two spaces over to that spot there. Uh, at this point, the orange player is done with their migration. I don't think they technically moved every one of their cubes, but they got pretty darn close to it, and they definitely used the two-space move instead of the one ability to their advantage. After all of this migration, none of their cubes are actually endangered because they have the gastropods, sponges, and the worms as elements on their board, and those are still all touching the various tiles they moved on to. Well, the orange player's turn is done, so that means the purple reptile player can go. And they were thinking about going here to score the reef again, but considering that solar radiation card is uh, cutting the victory points they would gain in half, they've decided it is probably going to be better for them to do a retrieve turn instead. So instead of placing this token out, they are going to retrieve all of their pawns from the board. Currently they have just four of them, and they would also retrieve any special action pawns that they control, but currently they don't control any. The next thing they have to do is focus over here, because if their cube is on the left side, they have to move it over to the right side. Now this is just a tracker to show whether or not a player has done at least one retrieve action, and once all of the player cubes reach the right side, the round will be over, and we will go into a reset, which I'm sure I'll describe in detail soon. The reptiles are done, which means we get to go again, and we technically have no legal places to put this down uh, because our lowest basic pawn is over there. So yeah, let's do a retrieve action ourselves. That means we are going to shift our cube to the right on the food chain area, and then we can retrieve all of our action pawns. And of course, we do have the control token for the plankton special pawn, so we can pull that one back and put it in front of us as well. Well, that's our turn done, so the orange player can go, and they are in the same position we were. Now, it's interesting to note that if we had decided to go onto this domination spot for our turn, then orange could have gone there, and in this situation, they could have done another domination action. So way back when I said it didn't really matter which one we chose, well, it did actually matter, because again, if we went here, we would have let the orange player do two domination actions before the first round ended. Fortunately, that is not the case, so their pawn is there, and again, you can go to the right on the same line as your bottommost pawn, but not to the left. So there are no legal placements for orange, so they are also going to do a retrieve action. So their food chain cube will be shifted over to the right, and in this moment, all of the cubes are over to the right, which means the first round of the game has come to an end, and it's now time for us to do a reseed event to set up the next round. The first thing that we have to do is remove all of the element tiles from the earth that are surrounded by three of these vent tiles. That means if there was a vent tile on these two spots and there was an element right there in the middle, then we would remove that element from the game. Obviously, at this point, we just have the starting vents on the board. More of them will show up when we do the tectonics action, which we'll probably get to soon, so none of these elements will be removed. The next thing that we have to do is focus over here on the regression box. If there were any of these element tokens in this box, then every player who does not have a cube on one of these spots will then lose one of the element tokens from their player board for each of the types that show up in this box. Now, if the type that is in this box matches a pre-printed element on your board, you do not have to lose anything. Now, obviously, in this moment, there are no elements in the regression box, so we will not lose anything. And then what happens is all of the tokens that are still in the adaptation area will slide down into regression. 
So that means when the next round of the game comes to an end and we perform regression, then each player who has at least one sun and at least one of the algae type of token on their board will lose one of those tokens. Now there is a way for certain players to get around regression and that involves these pawn spots over here. When you place an action pawn on there, you then take a cube from your gene pool and put it onto one of these spots. When we do the next regression action, if you have a cube over here, then you will not be affected by any of the potential regression penalties that show up in that box. Now, in our case, we do have a sun element token on our board, which means we are certainly motivated to perform a regression action before the end of the next round so that we can put a cube of ours in there so that these sun tokens won't remove the sun token from our board. That could really affect our endangered status for a lot of the species that we have on the board. Of course, it's possible once we get to that point that we don't actually care about that element on our board, and maybe it'll be better to use this action doing something else. That is just one of the many things that we have to consider while we are taking turns in this game. Moving on with the reseed, we now need to take any element tokens that are in the depletion box, as well as in the speciation action area and the waterlust area, and we are going to toss all of these back into the element bag. After that, if there are any element tokens in the autotrophs area, we slide those down into the depletion box. And once we do that, we then take any elements in the abundance area and we slide those down into the autotrophs box. Before we move on, let's now focus on autotrophs and depletion and talk about what these actions do in particular. Now, obviously, we couldn't do either of these in the first round of the game because we have to wait for these tokens to start trickling down. And over here for autotrophs, you'll notice there are two action spots. One is associated with smoker vents and the other one is associated with geyser vents. Now, whenever you place a pawn onto one of these, you will then select a vent that matches this specific type, and then you will perform one of the two autotroph actions. To explain these options, let's focus out and, for example, pretend like we were doing an autotroph action with a geyser. That means we have to find one geyser style vent, and at the moment, we have just one of these over here. Each of these vent tiles are double sided, with the smoker on one side and the geyser on the other. Mechanically, they are the same. The only time they matter is when we do an autotroph action because, of course, you can only select a tile of the specific type. Now, the geyser style events will be in the top part of the board, and the smoker style events are going to be on the bottom area of the board. Now, when it comes to the two autotroph action options, you can either select one element type that is currently in the autotroph box and remove an element token of that matching type that is adjacent to the vent that was selected. The other option is you can swap an element next to the event that you selected with an element token in the autotrophs box. So no matter what you choose, the autotroph action is all about manipulating the elements that are next to the event tiles that are out here on the board. Now once again, we are going to add more event tiles out with a tectonics action, which I will describe soon. So that is how the autotrophs action works, and now let's talk about depletion. Now, as I mentioned in the reseed, if there are any elements in the autotroph box, those are going to slide down into the depletion box. And when you do a depletion action, you can find a element on the main board that matches one in this box, and you simply remove it. It does not necessarily have to be next to a vent. So again, if you want to remove elements in this game, you could do it with the autotrophs action if that element is next to an event, or you could do a depletion action as long as that element does match one of the ones over here in this box. Well, let's move on, and we now need to take all of these terrain markers from the competition and evolution action areas, and we can put these back into the terrain marker draw bag. After that, we now need to draw random elements out of this bag for every one of these jellyfish icons that show up for abundance, adaptation, speciation, and wanderlust. Well, it looks like there is a lot of sponge adaptation potential in the future. After that, we need to draw three of these terrain tokens for the competition starfish spots on the board. And again, these will dictate where those specific competition actions can take place, where you can remove opposing species cubes from the board. After that, we need to draw five more landscape tiles from the bag for the evolution area, but we don't place those directly onto the board just yet. Now what we have to do is actually place them in the order that is dictated at the bottom of the board. You can see it goes land, kelp, reef, Mount, grass, sand, ocean, and vent. So that means the vents are always going to be on the far right spot. And if we have land, then those will always be on the left. In this case, we don't have any land, but we do have kelp. Then we have the reef, which is the next on that. 
After that, we have grass, and then we have the ocean. Now, again, the main difference with these is the number of optional uh, evolution cards that you can pick. So the tiles that are over to the left will score more victory points, but give you more restrictions for the cards you can play, whereas these ones over here score less points, but give you many more card options to choose from. The final thing we have to do for the reseed is shift all of these food chain cubes back over to the left. And now the game is ready to start once again with the next player in order. Uh, the orange player was the last one to move this cube over, which means the purple player gets to go. And there are actually no action pawns on the display, so they have a bunch of options available to them. And they've decided to go for an abundance action. That lets them place one of these elements onto an empty corner of a tile, and they're going to put a sun element down. And it looks like they actually want to place this way up here. We are next, and I think let's place a regular action pawn out. And I do think we should do a regression action. That means we simply take one of our cubes and we place it over there. So that means we will not be under threat to lose a sun or a algae icon from our board. Currently, we would only lose a sun, but that would still be bad, so I like having this already in the bank, so we don't have to worry about losing it. After that, the orange player can go, and they want to speciate next to a worm's element. They're going to select this one here, which is next to the ocean, the reef, and the sand, which means they can place four, two, and three species cubes down, respectively. They've decided to place as many as they can, so four will go there, two will go into the reef, and then three will go down onto the sand. After that, purple can go, and they also want to speciate. They are going to go next to a gastropod element, and they want to select this one here. Now that is next to two land tiles and one kelp forest, and when we look over here, land lets you put at most one cube down, and kelp only lets you put two. So that means for this action, they are only going to be placing four cubes down, but they are still fine with that. Purple is done, which means we can go, and if we want to speciate, our only options are the algae or the algae, or I suppose we could use our one special pawn to select any of the element tiles on the board to do that speciation action. For now, I think an algae speciation is probably fine, and doing a speciation is likely a good thing just to get some more cubes on the board to make us more flexible, especially considering we lose all ties when it comes to the tile scoring. So let's just use one of our basic pawns. We'll go over there, and then at the moment there is just one algae on the board. It's right on that spot. So we can place up to one cube onto the land, which does put us into first place for that tile. We can place up to two onto this kelp, and let's go for it. And then in the reef, we can place up to two as well. Orange is next, and they've decided to do a wanderlust action. They've decided to place one of these sand planes down and they're going to put it like this. It is adjacent to another tile, so that is legal. And then they're going to take one of these gastropod elements from the Wanderlust area, and they'll put this down onto that spot there. Actually, upon thinking about it even more, they want to increase their opportunities, so they're going to put it over there, considering there's already a gastropod element touching this tile here. Of course, they do get to score this. They have one adjacent sand to the one that they played, so that is going to be a count of two which means they will get three victory points, and that will bring them up to nine. After that, the purple reptiles can go, and they want to do the first tectonics action of the game. Now this action adds new vent tiles to the board, so they can take the top tile from the stack, and each of these tiles is double-sided with a smoker on one side and the geyser on the other. Now, when they place this down, it must go onto a tile that is on the edge of the hex grid. And an easy way to think about that is a tile is on the edge if it does not have six other tiles fully surrounding it. So that means right now the only tile they could not place this onto is the coral reef because that does have six tiles surrounding it, whereas all of the other tiles that we see have less than six. Now, purple has decided to perform the tectonic action on this open ocean spot. Now what they have to do is take all of the cubes from that spot and temporarily push them to the side. They then place this down and they put the relevant side face up. Now the geysers always show up on the spots that are on the top half of the board and the smokers always go on the bottom half. And if you happen to do a tectonics action on these three spots that split the two, you can decide which side it will be. 
Now this is obviously on the bottom half, so they have to put a smoker down and they'll place that there. And that is no longer an open ocean tile. It is now entirely a vent tile. After that, the active player will gain bonus points based off of the number of adjacent vent tiles to the one that they placed. And this works in the same way as Wanderlust with the vent tile here instead of the train type for the Wanderlust action. In this case, there is one tile placed and no vent tiles adjacent to it, so that means they will just get one bonus point. Of course, if they had placed this next to one of the tiles that were already on the board, they could have gotten three points, which is two points more than they're getting. But by placing over here, they will remove a bunch of their opponent's cubes from the board, and you'll see how that will be impactful very soon. So they'll just gain their one victory point, which will move them from 12 up to 13. Next up, they can return to this pile of cubes they removed, and up to one cube will be placed from this pile back onto that tile. After that, all of the remaining cubes will be returned to those players' gene pools. Now, this is an important distinction, because normally when cubes are removed from the board, they are removed from the game, but when a tectonic action happens, the cubes are removed from the board, but they go back to your gene pool where you can use them again. Obviously, this still isn't great, considering each of us spent actions to put these cubes on the board, and now they're right back into our gene pools, where we have to spend even more actions to place them out again. Finally, the active player can add one of their species cubes onto the vent tile they just placed, and that cube can either come from their gene pool, or it can actually come from the eliminated area, which is normally out of bounds. Now again, normally when you remove cubes from the map, they are removed from the game into an eliminated area, but this is one of the ways that you can start to bring these back into play in a very slow fashion. Now at the moment, the purple player has not had any of their cubes eliminated, so they'll just take one from their gene pool and add it onto the hydrothermic vent. So by doing that, they cleared off a bunch of their opponent's cubes, and they got to add one of their own, and they are now in the majority on this tile. Being in the lead on a vent tile does not seem like a great thing at first glance, because the first place player when the scores just gets one point, but there is another reason why you want to have cubes on these tiles, and that has to do with the survival card. Now this has been off to the side of the board up to this point, and as you can see, you give this card to the player with the most species cubes occupying vent tiles, and if there is a tie, then no player receives it. Up to this point, there has been a tie for zero cubes on vents, but now that is not the case. Purple has two, we have one, and orange has one, so purple has more cubes of their color on vent tiles, so they now get the survival card. Now when this is in front of you and a survival event happens, they are going to gain victory points. Now the survival event happens every time a new card is added to the row that has that specific icon on it, and when that happens, the player who has the survival card will gain bonus victory points for the number of vent tiles they have at least one of their cubes on. That means at the moment, if there was to be a survival event, the purple player would get just one victory point, because right now they have cubes on one vent, and on the bonus table, that just gives one point. So having this survival card means you can get bonus points when anyone does evolution actions, because you might have survival actions happen, but of course, that amount of points that you get is going to be dependent on just how many events you are at. Uh, so purple might get one point, but they are also motivated to maybe expand out onto more of the vents, and we are going to see more vents as the game goes on, as more people perform this tectonics action. Speaking of that, I'd like to briefly focus back on the special pawn action for tectonics, and that lets you do a standard tectonics action, but the tile that you put can go onto any tile on the board, including tiles that are surrounded by six other tiles. Well, purple is done, which means it's our turn, and I just realized we forgot to reveal another Wanderlust tile. It is an open ocean. Well, that is definitely an interesting tile to see. In fact, I think let's do a Wanderlust action. With this action, let's place the open ocean onto, well, I guess we could go on this spot here. It would have been a lot better just a few moments ago when that was an open ocean instead of a vent, but I think this is still good. So we'll place that there, and now we can see there are two other open oceans adjacent, so that's going to be one, two, three that we will use when we go to the bonus points table for that placement. Three is going to get us six points, which means we are once again in the lead with 16 points. After that, we can add one of these elements to that tile, and let's put this plankton down onto this spot. Just like that, we are now not endangered on either of these tiles. 
After that, players can move cubes onto this tile, although I just realized that I forgot that step when the orange player did their own Wanderlust action over here. Uh, they certainly would have moved some of these over, so considering the situation, let's just say they would have sent two of these over. Sorry for forgetting about that. Uh, we also could have used our camouflage to add one of our cubes from our gene pool onto this area, but I don't think we would have because we would have been endangered at that point, and up until we saw this open ocean, I don't think we were planning on doing a Wanderlust action. So we'll just leave that like it is, and now players can send their cubes over here. Now, the uh, reptile player gets to start this off, but they've decided they want to leave these cubes on the vent, so they're not going to move any over. After that, the uh, cephalopod player can, but they are endangered on the spot, because currently the only element there is plankton, and we are actually the only players adapted for that. So the cephalopod player is not going to move any over, and now we can, and I figure... Well, this one cube over here on the vent is not doing very much for us, but it also could help us when vying for survival later. So maybe let's just leave that there on the vent for now and probably try to speciate over here later. Uh, realistically, we did this to get a decent amount of points and to try and get another one of our plankton uh, elements out here on the board. At this point, the orange player can go and they want to skip all the way down here to the evolution area and they are going to score on a grass spot. Currently, there's just one seagrass spot on the board, and the reptile player is in first place because they are breaking that tie. But remember, instead of getting four points and two points, it is going to be two points and one point because of this solar radiation card that is still face up on the card row. That means they are giving their opponent one more point than themselves, but they seem to be just fine with that. So purple goes to 15 and orange goes to 10. After that, they have to perform an evolution card, and they can choose from the first, second, or third spot. In this case, they are going to go for the second spot, and this card says they will gain one victory point for each tile that your animal shares with one or more opposing species. It seems like they've been actually working towards this, because when we look out to the board, they share tiles with other species on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 tiles. That means that biodiversity card is going to get them 8 victory points now. That'll take them from 10 all the way up to 18, and that puts them in the lead. Next up, we can slide all of these cards down and then reveal another one. And this one is Producers. When this is performed as an evolution action, the active player will gain one victory point for each tile that they occupy that it contains at least one of the algae element. Now, in addition to that, there is a new effect printed down here, and it says when this card enters play, we have to immediately perform this text. Now, enters play is when this card is placed face up on the row, so that means as soon as this card is revealed, we have to remove all algae elements from the action display. There is one card in the deck for each of the 10 elements, just like this. So we have to remove all algae from the display, and that will remove this one from the autotrophs box, this one from the regression box, which could potentially be something people want to see, and then both of these will be removed from the speciation area, which means that also reduced the number of action spaces over here by one. Then all of these will be added back into the bag. All right, it's now time for the purple player to go, and they've decided to skip all the way over evolution and go onto a domination action spot. For this, they've decided to select the sun element, and now they can count the number of tiles where they have at least one species that also has the sun element. Now that is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then they have two sun elements on their board, which means their overall domination value is 7 times 2, or 14. That is certainly greater than 1, so they can move this up to the 14 spot, and then they can take that special action pawn. All right, we now get to go, and I think let's also do a big jump and take the other domination action spot. We do have a special action pawn that we can use to go above our other pawns, and this would let us dominate algae and sort of block this spot from the orange player. Orange does have a special pawn of their own, which they could use to kick this out, although if they did that, that would free us up to potentially play our basic action pawn on any of these spots because of that gap between our next highest pawn. So let's go for this. And when we look over here, there's just one algae icon on the board, and we are present in all three of the adjacent spots. So our tile count for domination is three, and we have just one algae in front of us, so that's going to be three times one or three. Obviously, this is not a strong domination, but it's still enough to move this up and get us this special action pawn, 
Currently, no other players are adapted to algae, so even though this is a low number, we'll still likely have access to this for a while, and these special action pawns give us access to the special spots and can also let us kick out our opponents, so having more of these is definitely a good thing. Well, the orange player can go, and they've decided to do another evolution action. This time, they're going to put it over here, all the way on the vent scoring spot. They do want to perform one of these evolution cards, so they have to select a vent that has at least one of their thriving species on it, and that's going to be this vent here. Now, the vents only score one point for the player who has the most cubes, so that is just going to be purple. So by orange going there, they've given the purple player one victory point. At first glance, that might not seem great. But the real reason they did this is because they can now perform any of the evolution card actions that are currently face up. With that in mind, they've decided to go with solar radiation. Again, this says that on each tile that the orange player occupies, they can return up to four species cubes there to their owner's gene pools. Now the orange player already spread out in order to get points from biodiversity, and now they're going to use that to wipe a ton of opposing cubes off the board. This is a very potent card, but it's worth noting they must return four species if possible, which means they might have to return their own. Um, that's probably going to hit them a few times, but they still think this is going to be worth it. So they'll start up here. They have to remove four, and there are just two, so these are gone. Over here, four have to be removed, so that means orange also lost their footing on that spot. Next up on this land spot, they are going to remove four, and they've decided to take two of the purple and two of the blue away. Then over here, both of these are gone. On this spot, the orange player is just going to remove all four of our cubes, which is obviously not something we like to see. And then in the coral reef, the orange player is going to, well, they actually like the idea of trying to put themselves in the lead. So they're going to get rid of one blue and then three of these purples. Moving on to this spot, there are four opposing cubes, so they're going to remove all of those. On this hydrothermic vent, all four of these will be removed, which means the purple player loses access to this survival card, and in fact, nobody gets it because everyone is tied at zero cubes on these vents. Now, this sand plane and that one will have all of their cubes removed, so that's a bit of a backfire there, and that is it. So overall, they still think this was very beneficial to them. When you look over here, it appears more of their opponent's cubes were removed than theirs were, and they are in some pretty good spots out here on the board. All of these cubes will be returned to gene pools. We can see the reptiles had 12 of their cubes removed. We had 11 removed. And the orange player lost 9. So overall, they made some pretty big gains on their opponents. Although if they had positioned themselves even better, they would have lost less of these. So that was a very impactful card on the overall game state. And the orange player thinks that that does put them in a better spot than the rest of the players. Well, the final thing Orange has to do is slide these cards down and reveal a new one. This is Niche Construction. It says you simply move an element on Earth to any other location. That might seem simple, but that could have massive effects on the game state, as it could make many cubes endangered and also change how the domination values work. Well, it's now time for the purple player to go, and they're going to use their special action pawn. With this, they've decided to do a special action speciation, which lets them use any element token to speciate. They've decided to go with this sun over here, so they'll speciate onto two sea mounts and one vent. That means they can put up to three on each mount and only one on that vent. They've decided to put the maximum down, and as soon as this cube is added onto that vent, they once again get the survival card because they have the most cubes with one compared to the zero of their opponents. Well, it's now our turn, and I think let's use one of our special pawns to kick out this purple pawn here. That will let us do a speciation next to a gastropod element, and then purple will gain this basic pawn back into their area. I think let's target this gastropod up there because we thrive in all three of these spots, and now that the solar radiation is gone, the scoring potential for being in first place on these locations is very high. Unfortunately, we only put one cube down onto the land areas and two cubes down into the kelp forest, but I still think that's going to be good for us. Our turn is done, but it looks like we forgot to flip this wanderlust tile again, so this should show a coral reef, and now we can continue on with the game. Orange is the next player to go, and they are going to use their special action to do another evolution action. This is their third evolution action in a row, and they can go behind their other pawns because they're using this special token. Now that lets them score a kelp tile. 
and we're not surprised to see them target this one here, especially considering we were obviously hoping to score for that kelp on our next turn by going onto this spot. Orange got their first though, and they are going to get four victory points for being in first place, and there is no second or third place player in the spot to get the other points. So Orange will go from 18 up to 25. After that, they must perform the evolution card in the first slot, and that one is Omnivore. It lets them select a tile that their animal occupies, and they remove one element token from that tile, and they eliminate one species cube from that tile as well. In this case, they are going to target that Seamount, because they do have a cube on it, and they are going to remove this Sun tile. After that, they have to eliminate a species, and they'll get rid of this Reptile one. So this can be put off to the side in the pool of eliminated cubes. And now we can see that by having this element removed, that was pretty devastating to the purple player because suddenly they are endangered in both of these spots. And that means if a extinction event happens right now, the purple player will have all five of these cubes go into that eliminated pool. After that, the cards can slide down and then we have to draw a new one and it's a survival event. Okay, the purple player is very happy to not see an extinction icon. Now remember, this survival event says that if a player has the survival card, they will immediately get bonus points based off of the number of vents their species cubes are currently on. At the moment, purple occupies just one vent, so that means that the bonus point table says they will get one victory point, which brings them up to 17, and hey, that's better than nothing. Before we move on, let's take a look at this population explosion card and see what it does when it's performed. This says the active player can select a tile and place X species from your gene pool onto that tile, where X is the number of all species cubes already present. So this X does not always mean the slot, sometimes it's other things. So for example, if somebody was to perform this now and target this coral reef, they would add 8 of their own cubes down on here, effectively doubling the number of cubes on that spot. Now, as you can see, these cards can have massive effects on the game state, some adding a bunch of cubes, some removing a bunch, some putting a bunch of cubes into endangered positions, and even more that just change things up in a wide variety of ways. Well, the orange player's turn is done, so now the reptile player can go. And they currently don't have any legal placement because they don't have any special action pawns, and their basic pawn is down here on the bottom. So instead, they are going to do a retrieval turn, where they return all of these back to their area, and they do control the Sun Special Action Pawn, so they can take that one as well. After that, their cube will be slid over on the food chain chart. It's our turn to go again, and let's use our Special Action Pawn. And do a special speciation. A bunch of our cubes were removed, so I think it's a good thing to add them back. And by going over here, we can select any of the element tokens on the map. We have a bunch of options available to us, and I think let's target this one down over here. That is a plankton, and it will let us put four down into this open ocean. We can put two into this sand plane and two into that sand plane. So just like that, we are uh, putting a bunch of cubes back. Obviously, these spots don't score a bunch of victory points when we actually target them, but this is going to help us out with uh, various domination values, and we could also potentially expand out into other places with wanderlust actions in the future. In addition to that, if we are able to adapt into the gastropod, that could really help us out with that domination later on in the game. Potentially, we could take it away from the orange player. The last thing to note is that we actually need to put three down in the sand areas, not two, so it should actually look like this, which is even better. Well, it's now the orange player's turn, and they are going to do a dominate action. They've decided to target sponges. Currently, there's just one of that element on the board, and they are on two of those adjacent tiles, so that means their tile count is at two. And they have just one of that element, so their domination value is 2 times 1, or 2. Fortunately, that is greater than 1, which is what they needed to take this special action pawn. I'm sure somebody will do this domination again before the game is over, but for now, the orange player does get this pawn that they can use in the future. Well, purple is up, and they have all of their pawns to choose from, and they desperately want these uh, species over here to not be endangered anymore. With that in mind, they are going to do an abundance action. And with that, they are going to place this sun down over here onto the map. Now, they could put it here where that previous sun was, but they've actually decided to place this over there. 
these species are not endangered because the reptiles are adapted to the sponges. So by going there, they have increased their uh, thriving area. Of course, being in these open ocean spots isn't amazing from a victory point perspective, but it is very likely that more vents will pop up over here, and it looks like the orange player wants to have a stronger claim on the survival card, and also wants to get more points for the survival events when they happen. Either way, for the moment, none of these cubes are endangered anymore, so the purple player can breathe a sigh of relief there. Well, it's now our turn, and we have no legal plays, so let's retrieve our pawns. We do control the plankton and the algae special pawn, so we can take those back in addition to the rest of our pawns. After that, our cube will be slid over, and it's now time for the orange player to go. They could retrieve, but they've decided to use this special action pawn, and they have decided to speciate. They want to do this with a gastropod, so they could go here or there, and they figure they may as well block this spot for the moment. The gastropod element they want to target is this one, so that will let them put three of their species onto the sand plain. Two can go into this kelp forest, and two will go onto the coral reef, where they are now back in first place. All right, it's now the purple player's turn, and they've decided to use their special action pawn to do the special action option over here for a tectonics action. Now, this lets them place a vent tile down onto any non-vent spot on the board. It does not need to be on the edge of the hex grid. In this case, they are going to target that open ocean right there. This is on the bottom half of the map, so it is going to be a smoker, and there were no cubes to remove from the spot. So that will go there, and then they will score bonus points for the adjacent vents. It always counts this tile here, so that's one, two, three, and that means they will get six victory points. They were at 17, so that's going to bring them up to 23, and then they can bring up to one species cube from their gene pool or from the eliminated pool back out onto this vent. They do have an eliminated cube, so they're going to place that onto this vent, and now if a survival event happens, the number of victory points they get will be even more than it was before. Well, it's now time for us to go, and we have all of our pawns back. For the moment, I think let's use a basic pawn and use it to do an abundance action. That will let us put this plankton out. And the reason I'm doing this now is because the round is almost over. And when that happens, these are going to cycle down. So getting this out now is probably a good thing, considering we appear to be the plankton specialists. We could potentially set things up to have a massive domination action later on in the game to get the domination value up into the 30s or even the 40s. And if we have that token at the end of the game, all of those turn into victory points. So making a big modifier out here on the map will definitely be in our favor. With that in mind, I think for the moment, let's put this over there. Neither of these tiles had plankton next to them before, and now they do, and whatever tile shows up here will as well once that Wanderlust action happens. Our turn is done, so now the orange player can go, and they have no action pawns in front of them, so they must do a retrieve action. So they can bring all of these back, and they do control the gastropod and sponge special action pawns, which they can take back as well. After that, we can slide this cube over, and since all of the cubes are on the right side, it's now time to do the second reseed event of the game. Just like last time, the first thing that we check is to see if there are any elements on this board fully surrounded by three of the vents. This element here has two vents around it, which means if a vent goes over here, then in the next reseed phase, that element will be removed, so that might have been a bit of a risky play for the reptile player, but they thought it was a good idea at the time. Currently, we don't have to remove any, though. And now it's time to perform the regression action. There are sun elements in this box, which means every player has to remove up to one sun element token from their board. Now I did say every player, but if there is a player cube over here, then that player gets to ignore it, so we do ignore this regression. That's good considering we do have a sun token over here that is at threat, and obviously that's why we took that action. Over here, the orange and purple players don't lose anything because they don't have any of the tokens on their board. These sun tokens are printed onto that mat. After that, we could continue on with the rest of the reseeding steps, but I'm not going to do that because at this point I'm going to stop playing through the game and now discuss how the game will end and how we perform final scoring. Let's start off with the game end condition, and that involves this deck of cards. Obviously, we've been drawing cards from the top as the evolution actions have been happening, and once we get near the end of this deck, we are always going to hit the asteroid card. Now, in particular, we want to look at the bottom six cards of the deck, because during setup, we always shuffle the asteroid card in with the bottom five cards. In this case, the asteroid was actually at the very bottom of the deck. 
Now, as you can see, this asteroid has an extinction icon as well as a survival icon on it. So that means as soon as this is placed out onto the board, we do both of those things and we do it in this order because, of course, that extinction event could knock out some cubes that would help to score for survival. Now, this will stay out here until a player does an evolution action where they decide to choose this card and perform the action. As you can see, it says that player will select a tile and they will eliminate all but one species cube on that tile, and then they will eliminate one species cube on each adjacent tile. Then the game will end after the next reseed event. So what that means is after this is taken, we will still continue to play until all of these cubes are pushed over to the right on the food chain area, and at that point the game will be over, you don't even need to perform that final reseed event. Once the game is over, we can then move into final scoring, and the first thing that we do is another extinction event and another survival event. So that means not only will we have both when the asteroid comes into play, but when the game is over, we will perform both again. So when we move on with the rest of our final scoring, there will be no endangered species out here because the extinction event will have wiped all of them out. After that, each player will score victory points for their control tokens, each one of which is worth a number of victory points equal to that associated element's spot on the track. So right now, the purple player would get 14 victory points for this. The uh, cephalopod player over here would get just 4 points for this gastropod control token and 2 points for that one there. So that even though they have 2, they got way less points than this one over here. And for us, we would get 6 points for the plankton and 3 points for the algae. So obviously we'd want to get these much higher before the game actually ended. Also, by stealing these away from each other, you can take a significant amount of points away from opponents. After that, the final thing that we do is score every single tile out here on the board. That means we give victory points for the first, second, third, or even fourth spot, depending on the tile type, and ties are broken just like normal using the food chain order. So board positioning is incredibly important when you get near the late stages of the game because a ton of points are on the line when we go through final scoring. After that, the player with the most victory points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then the food chain will break that tie with the animal at the top of the food chain in that tie, breaking it in their favor. Well, at this point, I've now taught you just about all of the rules to the game, which means this tutorial has come to a close. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Dominant Species Marine. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.